welcome back. Our next panel, panel three, is titled Actors and Aspirations in the U.S. Indo-PACOM Area of Responsibility. Moderating the panel is Dr. Nicholas Gavazdev from the U.S. Naval War College. His panelists will provide their, providing their perspectives are distinguished experts, including Dr. Elizabeth Wishnick, uh, Mr. Devon Shannon, and Chief Warrant Officer Maurice Dukdushis from U.S. SOCOM Commander Special Staff. Dr. Gvozdev, I think, is broadcasting from a bunker somewhere today. He is uh, the editor of Orbis uh, Foreign Policy Research Journal of the World Affairs and Senior of World Affairs Council and a senior fellow at FPRI Eurasia Program. He's also professor of national security affairs, holding the Captain Jerome E. Levy Chair in Economic Geography and National Security at the U.S. Naval War College. And Dr. Gavazdev, are you in your bunker? I am here and uh, broadcasting from outside of Newport, Rhode Island, uh, outside of the uh, Naval War College. So, and we're ready to go with our, with our panel, which I think is quite important uh, for being connective tissue uh, between panel two about China's aspirations and then moving forward to uh, looking at the U.S. strategy because we have to have a sense of who the, who the actors are in the region, who are the potential indispensable partners uh, for the United States, uh, and uh, also uh, are there partners that we would like to have whose price may be too high for us to pay uh, as we move forward. So uh, it's an important reminder that the region is not just simply China and the United States, uh, but, but other actors. Uh, I think we will turn uh, first uh, uh, to Mr. Shannon uh, for uh, his presentation, looking at uh, a country in particular in the region that we don't think as much about, but that is one of the most uh, strategically uh, placed uh, nations in the region and for what this says about how we should be thinking about potential partners, the costs and risks of those partners, uh, the benefits that they may bring uh, for our strategic positions. So, uh, Mr. Shannon, I'll turn the floor over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this panel. So, as you can see from uh, the first slide, partners has been part of uh, my entire career uh, in special forces and in the US Army, and especially in the Asia Pacific theater, the Indo Pacific theater. Um, and so, when thinking about partners, you know, especially the last panel talking about mirror imaging, I think it's important to remember some of the basics and the basics about war, basics about why people go to war, why people fight. Um, and that kind of brings us back to these three guys. It doesn't matter what time and place you're at, this tends to dominate. Uh, the discussion about why people fight. When we're talking about partners, we really got to think about why would a partner be willing to put themselves on the line for us and how would they be willing to put themselves on the line for us? Because not everyone's going to look like us. Not everyone's going to put two forward, one back, BCT, you know, air dominance and things of that nature. We have to remember why they're willing to fight, what they're willing to fight for, and how they're willing to fight. And when you're looking at partners, this is extremely important. So I always remember with, uh, with the enemy, you know, know your enemy. Um, this is a critical piece uh, in this slide, you know, with how the Chinese look at things. I think with the last two sets of panels, this was made very clear. They have a plan, they have a desired goal, and they're moving forward on that. Um, so, and of course, the Chinese, as one of the previous panelists said, they tend to tell us what they're trying to do. You see right there, we have a map. That map has pretty much been the same since 1945. There was a, a small adjustment there down in Vietnam, erased a little bit of a line and reunited the Vietnams together in 75. And then down in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, East Timor became an independent state. But besides that, this is how we tend to view the world and the Indo-Pacific region. And we see it as pretty stable and the lines is pretty solid. And again, this is one of our biggest challenges when we're dealing with um, China and the way they view things. So next slide. This is how China sees the way the world should be. And this is the way the world was 
before all the redheaded uh, barbarians showed up and started to change things. And you'll see that that map is what a previous speaker talked about, which is before the century of humiliation. You know, all the yellow things were controlled by the Qing, of course, who are Manchurians, not Chinese. And then all the, all the orange were all the dependencies because all of them really didn't have foreign policies and they depend upon direct trade with the greater China. And then of course, to look at the next map, please. The next map is published, of course, by uh, Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China at the end of the war. And that's what they thought that they were owed and what the borders should be if they were gonna be one of, the, of Roosevelt's five policemen. And you'll notice on those borders, we tend to fixate a lot uh, as of late in the bottom right-hand corner and their claims over the South China Sea. And we don't look necessarily at what the rest of their claims are. When you look on detail at that map, you'll see that Mongolia is definitely not an independent country as far as they are concerned. And until very recently, uh, the late 2010s, Taiwan still considered Mongolia as a dependency and part of its claim of one China. Uh, they have recently dropped that. And of course, you see that on the bottom, another conflict area in this past year, Ladakh, which was definitely claimed on this map by uh, Chiang Kai-shek and now in, has been taken on by, uh, by Xi Jinping as what is his definition of China. And so maps matter, ideas matter. And of course, that brings us to the next slide, which is kind of the partner we're talking about as an example of a partner, um, which is the Mongolians. And the Mongolians are very unique um, and kind of created this collage, of course, sent around that population map of the uh, Mongolian uh, population and where they're kind of out besides just in Mongolia. And you can also see with uh, this map and this collage, one of the things that makes Mongolia interesting, which I heard on the streets of uh, Ulaanbaatar many times in the coffee shops and in many a uh, Gare visit, the, when conversation uh, switched to the third neighbor policy, which is their policy of working with not just their two neighbors that encompass them, Russia and China, but with their third neighbors, which are friends outside, mainly the United States, India, Japan, um, the European Union, is that first Hong Kong, then Taiwan, then us. And you can hear that in the halls of uh, power within Ulaanbaatar, and you can hear that in, in the Gares, in the uh, most furthest regions and most undeveloped parts of uh, rural Mongolia. And again, this goes back to some of the Thucydides concepts of honor, self-interest, and fear, and Clausewitz's idea of hatred, chance, and reason. You know, one of the things about Mongolia that is very clear is the desire to maintain their Mongolian culture and their Mongolian civilization. Uh, what sometimes we forget with each one of these partners has a very unique relationship with China. And when we're looking at partners, we have to think about what can that partner do? What can that partner not do? And why would they be willing to partner with us? And uh, I just kind of leave you with this collage as uh, my kind of time is up here. Um, to just kind of think about the fact that Mongolia was the second communist state and they made a deal with the communist Russians and Soviets so that they could save themselves from China. Mongolia was the only state that the central government in Beijing and Nanjing ever recognized as no longer part of China. They both reneged on that. Um, and it's one that supposedly went through massive amounts of westernization and communization, yet as soon as they regained their independence through a peaceful revolution in 1991, one of the first things they did was build a giant statue of Chinggis Khan and reinstate many of their traditional ways of doing things, which are kind of depicted on the bottom. Another thing about partners is what are they willing to do? Um, and one of the things about Mongolia, again, not always looking at their words, but looking at their deeds. Um, they're one of the most effective UN partners and they've been with us in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that was a choice. They didn't have to do that. And they, they've paid uh, quite a bit of a price for that, uh, both politically and otherwise, but they felt it was important to demonstrate. And so when we look at partners, we always got to look at why they would be willing to fight and what they'd be willing to do. And so with that, I just want to hand it off to Nick as kind of starting our kind of conversation about partners and our relationship with partners and what can we do with those partners. 
Thank you very much. And I think it's important to have started with a country that isn't often on our radar when we think of the Indo-PACOM theater, and particularly uh, my own bias here from being at the Naval War College, as we tend to think of uh, maritime littoral states, uh, but a reminder that uh, we also have a complete interior of Indo-PACOM and you know, the opportunities as well as the challenges of partners like, like Mongolia. That gives us, I think, a, a wonderful segue uh, into uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wishnick's uh, presentation, uh, which is to look at the uh, perhaps the elephant or maybe more accurately the bear in the room in Indo-PACOM uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the big Eurasian partner to the north or the big Eurasian competitor to the north for either Russia or for China or for the United States, uh, which is the question of Russia. So, uh, Dr. Wishnick, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you today. And uh, thank you also to Dr. Marsh for inviting me to this forum. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Uh, can my slides be loaded. Ah, there we go. Uh, uh, so uh, we just heard about uh, partners and how relations uh, with China affect uh, the calculations that we may have in our approach to partners. Well, I think that uh, goes double for the China-Russia partnership uh, that has an impact on our partners as well. And so I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the challenge posed by the Sino-Russian partnership and uh, try to go beyond some of the rhetoric we typically hear about whether this is an axis of convenience or an axis of authoritarianism and ask uh, what is the challenge uh, posed by uh, this partnership. Um, I argue that it's a partnership of consequence and I'm going to explain uh, why by addressing five different aspects of this partnership and draw some implications for US strategy to meet the challenge that it poses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so is this an alliance? That's the question on everyone's mind. And uh, we hear a lot of different viewpoints, uh, not just in the United States, but by Chinese and Russian leaders themselves, which makes this a complicated question. Uh, Vladimir Putin most recently uh, said that uh, we can't rule out an alliance, but on other occasions he says we don't need an alliance. Um, and so uh, why, why, does, why the double speak on this point? I think for, for Russia, uh, the ambiguity about an alliance with China is in effect a deterrent strategy, much like our strategy of strategic ambiguity with respect to the Taiwan question that he uh, says it may be an alliance or maybe it isn't, we don't know. And so uh, that's, I think, a part of his calculation. For China, it's a little bit different. Uh, recently, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, uh, said that uh, there are no limits to the relationship with Russia, suggesting that this could be more than an alliance, not just an alliance, but he didn't mention alliance in his statement. And of course, China has a longstanding policy against alliances. Um, on the other hand, Chinese leaders also uh, emphasize that uh, domestic factors are key drivers uh, to this partnership. And uh, this means that there could also be limitations to the partnership because of the different types of domestic circumstances that each country faces. And I'll talk more about that later. Next slide, please. Do they coordinate? So we saw most recently a buildup of Russian forces on the border with Ukraine and uh, China's increased pressure against Taiwan right around the same time in the first part of April. Were they coordinating? Uh, they do have what's called a comprehensive strategic partnership of cooperation for a new era, which is a mouthful. Uh, that was their 2019 uh, iteration of their partnership. Um, but I would argue these were simultaneous pressure tactics, but not necessarily coordinated. And generally speaking, when we see China and Russia, they employ parallel, but not coordinated actions. And these reflect their very different interests. 
and they agree to disagree on a whole host of issues. For example, Ukraine, the South China Sea, uh, and, and Russia does not want to get involved with Taiwan. I think uh, they, they've had that policy consistently since uh, the 1950s. Um, so uh, why no coordination? I think they have different positions on certain key issues in the Indo-Pacific, on India, even on North Korea, not identical positions. And China wants to be seen as the leading power in this region and has stated often that Asia should be for Asians. And so where does this leave Russia? Uh, Russia is considered a European country by China. Um, so I don't think that China would, would want to be coordinating with Russia in an area that it considered as its own sphere. And for Russia, uh, going too close to China puts its own interests and partnerships at stake with India, with Vietnam, and so forth. Next slide, please. Is Russia China's junior partner? This is often stated uh, in the analysis that we see on the partnership, but I think it provides a false picture for a number of reasons. It's true that if you look at the economic indicators, Russia is definitely the weaker party um, and sanctions only compound this situation. However, I think we should keep in mind, um, as Andrew Erickson pointed out on the previous panel, that China faced a whole host of problems and China downplays its own weaknesses, its resource dependence, um, its water scarcity, which, which would compound concerns about food supply, its soft power challenges, the wary border ties it faces with almost all of its neighbors and some conflicts on its borders. Uh, David Shambao has called China a lonely power. And I think without Russia, China would be alone indeed, especially in the UN Security Council. <laughs> and so China needs Russia, uh, but doesn't like to say so. Um, so Russian support for Chinese positions uh, bolsters China's claim uh, to leadership of an East Asian order. Next slide, please. So what are the drivers of this partnership? There are, there are some factors you're all well aware of, border security, energy, uh, military needs, also increasingly high tech agriculture. We've seen some vaccine collaboration lately, uh, but I think more broadly speaking, the two countries aim to create what they call a new type of great power relations. This is a term often uh, directed at the US-China relationship, but before that it was applied to the China-Russia partnership. And this implies certain principles, non-interference in the affairs of authoritarian states, <laughs> forget democracies, um, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, the peaceful resolution of, of disputes, and the uh, stronger role for the United Nations. So to downplay the role of the US in maintaining order. For Russia, there's more of an emphasis on the equality of the partnership than is true in the Chinese language. Um, what does this mean concretely? Um, in East Asia, we, or in the Indo-Pacific Indo region, we see some different positions being staked out on certain questions, such as information sovereignty, um, opposition to US partnerships and alliances to the deployment of FAD systems, um, and so on. So we see the, the, both the uh, normative aspect of how they see an East Asian order, and they object both to the term Indo-Pacific for different reasons, and the concrete policies that they, they are either opposed to or uh, promoting. And then finally, next slide, please. Uh, what are the limitations of this partnership? So I, I think the, there, the limitations are clear on the peripheries. Uh, in particular, the Arctic and in Central Asia. So uh, Russia is going to be taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. It'll be very interesting how the relationship with China plays out in this context as China seeks to justify its role as a near Arctic state, which Russia has, has always opposed. 
Uh, Russia is not so keen on the Polar Silk Road, which is a challenge to its northern sea route. And uh, China is wary of Russian territorial claims and stewardship of the NSR. Uh, so that's an area to watch. Another one is Central Asia with the drawdown of US forces. Who is going to manage security there? China already has a border security forces in Tajikistan, and Russia has long claimed to be the uh, manager of security in Central Asia. So far, China has expressed little interest in bringing troops on the ground in Afghanistan, although it does have some, some private security there. So how is that situation going to play out? And then other things to watch, this is the 20th anniversary of the uh, 2001 Sino-Russian Treaty of Friendship and Good Neighborly Cooperation, another mouthful there. And so we'll see what happens after that. Will they, uh, will they revise the treaty? Will they upgrade the treaty? And similarly, what will happen to the 1993 military cooperation agreement that's been updated annually for the most part? Is that going to change in any direction that will give us a clue about whether or not um, this is an alliance or not? And so to conclude, I would say the two countries have shared interests. Uh, they act in parallel, not in coordination, uh, largely um, brought together by domestic drivers and not a reflexive response to US or NATO actions. And so I don't think some kind of reverse Nixon strategy of driving wedges is going to be effective. Um, however, the, the partnership does show some limitations in particular areas such as the Arctic and, the, and Central Asia. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think our first two uh, presenters have given us uh, a great overview uh, in the sense uh, from uh, Shannon's uh, presentation of a country like Mongolia aspirationally seeking to be a partner of the United States, can bring some capabilities to the table, also bring some uh, challenges uh, for, for action. Uh, Elizabeth's presentation on Russia, the idea that to the extent that without uh, Russia, China is a lonelier power and is there uh, a potential there. Uh, and so then that brings up the 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 third uh, panel panelist uh, to discuss. Great. Now that we have these ideas, how do we put them into action? What's the challenge for the practitioner in dealing with actors and aspirations in this area? And so we'll turn to uh, Chief Warrant Officer uh, Duke Duclo uh, to uh, wrap out uh, our panel uh, with the practitioner's perspective of these issues. Thanks, Nick. Um, first, I want to thank Jay Sal. Uh, General Howard, Dr. Wilson, SOCOM for hosting this event. This is great. And, you know, it's uh, it's not lost on me that uh, I'm sitting in the building right now and I'm still in a green suit, right? And so I understand kind of my role in this panel is that practitioners and, you know, um, the tactical perspective, if you will. Um, so I, I like to, to um, say that while today's, uh, you know, all of the speakers today brought a great perspective from the very academic and strategic level, you know, I like to look at things kind of as a bridger between the team room and the academia or between the strategic and the tactical. And so what I'm going to present today, and I don't have any slides, I apologize. What I'm going to present and talk about today uh, in just for just a short intro is how I frame this discussion or how I think this framing could help those at the tactical level understand better what we're talking about. Because, again, um, everyone's talking at this level that, you know, it, it adds insight, I think, to the strategic discussion, but the so what, the how, the giving me something that I can get my teeth on uh, and wrap my teeth around and, and, and give me some meat, um, it's just not there, in my opinion, as a practitioner. So um, how do I look at this? When, when I look at the topic of the panel of actors and aspirations, first, I'm gonna talk about the actors and I'm gonna frame it in a way that would apply to any game if we're talking about it. Now, doctrinally, our doctrine generically, our, our general purpose doctrine really is a two player game, right? So it's looking at us versus them. Um, any, any type of general warfare is, is a two nation state or two nation game, us versus them, or it's a coalition, right? So it could be a coalition of nations, us versus them, again, building teams. Um, now our special operations doctrine, uh, specifically let's say FIT or UW, it's really a multiplayer game. Right, so we are either supporting or countering a non-state actor um, in a third nation. So really, a three-player game uh, in this regard. 
Uh, but I think GPC and what we're talking about today, for the most part, is is that point in time in the continuum um, below the threshold of armed conflict, right? So although the current definition, and we've talked about the differences in the definition, could extend into armed conflict or even cooperation, specifically what I'm talking about is who are the actors in that um, time frame that, that manifest below the threshold of armed conflict. And if we look at this, uh, obviously it's a multiplayer game, no matter where, we, where, it, where it plays out because not only is it uh, the competitor country, let's say in Indo-Pakistan, we're talking about PRC, um, and us, right? So that's two major players, two major actors. Um, but there's also a, a place that we're playing it. There's a playing board, right? And so I'll call this country X. So we have country C, our competitor. We have country U, we'll call it us. And we have country X, which is wherever we're playing. And that's gonna manifest differently in every single country that we talk about, because the rules to that game and how it how it plays out are gonna be different based on country C's goals and aspirations in that country, and based on the limitation factors and the denial of freedom of maneuver that we have, country U and country X, if that makes sense. Um, so at the very minimal, it's a three party game or a three player game, three actors. Now, um, earlier I said in soft doctrine, we look at the non-state actor as a player involved as well. And we'll say that, you know, they, they, they get a vote in this or one of their actors that are involved. Um, but I would say in this GPC, we can't confuse the, the ways with the means, right? And so uh, on the last uh, conference, uh, someone said, and it wisely said that, you know, uh, we, we, we often look as, you know, the population as the target and we have to start looking at them as the tool. And I, and I agree with that completely. I think that when we're talking about the actors in a competition, we have to look at ones that have a vested interest in this at the level that we're talking about, because we are talking about great power competition. And although the the, the dialogue might be, or the narrative might change to strategic competition, uh, I've said before that if it was, you know, the Federated States of Micronesia that was a revisionist state and they wanted to change the status quo, I don't know that so much it would, you know, disrupt America and we would think this is a big deal. I think it matters because these are great powers. And and this gets me to the my final point on this, which is the aspirations. Um, you know, we have the actors in this game, which are going to be different in every single country. However, at a minimum, we're talking about three actors, country U, country X and country C. Now, all three have different aspirations in this game. And if we look how it plays out, um, all, all, all of those aspirations are gonna be asymmetric, right? So in this case, in Indo-PACOM, uh, with country C being China or PRC, uh, obviously they're, they're are a revisionist state. They're trying to change the status quo. And so what we are trying to do is trying to maintain the status quo, trying to maintain our, our access network and maintain our you know, um, power projection and our capabilities and maintain the, the, the status quo of, of the post-World War II order um, that we've enjoyed. Um, they are not, they are not. They're definitely in a revision and a growth mode on the rise, right, as a great power. And so their aspirations in this game are completely different than ours and how they play it is completely and how it manifests is completely different and how we play against them is asymmetrical. And then finally, Country X, what are their aspirations and, and how do they play the game? Um, in many ways, we've tried to force these country X's, whatever, whoever they are, let's say someone brought up Thailand or, or Taiwan or Mongolia in, uh, in Devan's example. Um, it's not a us or them, right? So if there's a hegemeter of saying, you know, are they leaning more toward country C or are they leaning more toward country U? Where do they sit in this? Um, it's not a scale because they're gonna play mom against dad. And the way that they win in this game is to look out for their own best interests, which may align some with country C and may align some with country U and may be completely different in a country by country basis. So I think if we were looking at this as a game, a board game, if you would, um, that country X can win with country C, or they can win with country U, or they can win independently of a win from either country U or country C. And so if we if we really frame this in a very, in the most simple of senses of what, and, and I use the term win um, just to, to preempt that discussion, um, because I do think there are wins. Um, a lot of people jump on this, this concept of competition and they, they jump on the Simon Sinek infinite game theory that there is no win, just staying in the game. And I agree with that to, a, to an extent, but I think that there's a series of finite games nested within the infinite game that you can definitely lose. 
And so I think there are goals, strategic goals, that the competitors are trying to achieve that puts them in a position of advantage, that they can win those games, those finite games, nested within that infinite game. And I think how we play, who the players are and how each of them plays is important to the discussion as we look for then how to play, how to play the game, um, because we all have a different stake in this, uh, depending on who we are and where we're playing at. Thank you very much. I think that's a great segue into our conversation. Uh, and so let me uh, take the moderator's uh, prerogative and offer to the panel a, a broad-based uh, query, uh, which is for policymakers, for the services, for components, you know, what criteria ought to we be using to evaluate the actors in the region? in terms of assessing who do we need, uh, what do we need, versus also, and I think uh, uh, Warrant off Sir Duclos' point, uh, that uh, you know, these, this is a three-level game, uh, that uh, not everyone's interests are always aligned. And so you know, are we going to also run into a situation where for a particular country, let's say I'm just thinking Tajikistan, you know, China might say, look, we want to make some border revisions where the revision is a really big deal to Tajikistan. For the U.S., we may not like it, but it's not a priority. But if it comes to the uh, uh, Senkaku Islands between Japan and China, that's a very big deal for us. Uh, so can you give us maybe, you know, a, a for, you know, your opinion for all three of you of sense of uh, the criteria that you would use for assessing you know, actors and aspirations uh, in the theater. Nick, you want me to start first? Go right ahead. Yeah, go to anyone who wants to take it. It's, yeah. uh, I'll try and keep this short. And I really want to dovetail with what uh, Duke said and to a degree what Elizabeth said. And it all comes down to that uh, self-interest concept. And of course, and I think that's the biggest thing we have to be very clear-eyed on is as uh, Chief Duclo said, what country X wants, what is their self-interest? And the self-interest for the people as a mass, the self-interest of the military, and the self-interest of uh, the governing elite, doesn't matter which party's in power, and depending upon what type of government structure you have, each one of them has a unique self-interest. At the same time, we, as the United States, have a self-interest. And I think that many times, like you brought out, our self-interest on the Senkakus, a bunch of un- uh, occupied islands that we gave to Japan at the end of uh, World War II and have since uh, protected has a lot more to our self-interest because it's directly related to our relationship with Japan. And ever since uh, the end of World War II and our conversion of Japan from our number one enemy to our number one friend in Asia, uh, that is a critical part of our self-interest. It's important to them, therefore it's important to us because they're important to us. When you bring up Tajikistan, yes, it's in the self-interest of the Tajiks, the Tajiks see many, much of their land being taken by other powers and that they are in a um, weaker position. But again, how important is Tajikistan to the United States? And we have to look at each one of these partners and powers. And as, as Chief says, country X, what do we think that country X can do for us? What does country X want to do? And because of what it wants to do as what their military wants to do, what their government wants to do, what their people want to do and are willing to sacrifice for, therefore we have to make a decision of how much we're willing to support that, how much is important to us in our great game uh, with specifically the Chinese Communist Party and our desired end state as uh, the general spoke in the last uh, session about a free and open Indo-Pacific. And does that count that action specifically hinder our desire for a free and open Indo-Pacific, which tends to be very maritime focused and not very uh, land-based? Uh, if I might add, uh, I, I really appreciated uh, uh, Duke's point about aspirations. I think that's that's a great concept to keep in mind. And I think when we when we try to understand Russia's role in this region, we have to reflect more on that. Because I think um, there's a lot of 
talk about Russia as a disruptive power, but in fact, Russia, I think, sees itself as one trying to restore a previous status quo. And, and so a, a, I think historical criteria are also important to keep in mind, looking at the, the arc of how a country sees its role in a particular place. And it's been fascinating uh, for me to uh, follow the uh, competition between Russian and Chinese vaccines in, uh, in Central Asia and how uh, Russia manages to have a degree of, of uh, enduring soft power because of historical and scientific ties. And, and so I think uh, we need to keep in mind uh, the history uh, and in terms of how these aspirations are developed. And the other kind of criteria I think is a level of analysis uh, focus, uh, distinguishing between the global level where we have um, a broader aspirations for, for um, China's uh, role in, uh, East, in the Indo-Pacific as a whole or in global governance as a whole versus very specific issues such as uh, border issues with Tajikistan, uh, where you have uh, also history interfering in China's efforts to promote the Belt and Road with a lot of border security concerns that emerge. And, and so I think um, different levels of analysis, whether on the specific uh, um, uh, border aspect, the regional focus or the global focus will give us a clear pathway to uh, understanding our partnerships. Yeah, I think, um it's a perfect segue, and, and uh, I think that uh, you know when when we have to look at this at different levels as well. And so again, I'm I'm here. I'm the tactical guy, right? I'm the operator's perspective. So when I look at how do I evaluate a criteria for a partner? So when I'm talking specifically about what I'm looking for in a partner actor, not an opponent actor, right? Because I'm a, if I'm evaluating the criteria of an uh, opponent actor or competitor against me, I have to weigh them against their strategic goals and aims. Are they achieving their strategic goals and aims? Okay, so that's the measurement that I'm gonna uh, you know, measure them against, not what mine are. So I'm not. it's not a comparative analysis because it's an asymmetric end that we're going for, right? But if I'm looking at my partnering, right, um, I have to look at where my gaps are at. So ultimately, my theory, specifically on UW, and I've said this before in other panels, is I think that, uh, or on SOF, is that SOF um, is able to operate in a denied area. What I mean by that is uh, conventional forces, I, could, I can move in the 82nd and they can strike a dam that China is trying to build and, and knock it down, then I don't need a partner. I really don't, but that area is denied in some way. Now, traditionally, we think of denied area in our doctrinal context as being geo-denied, right? It's behind enemy lines, it's geographically denied. I think that that context has to be changed in the competition context of our doctrine, right? I think we have to expand that definition to mean politically denied or, you know, or, or permissively denied or racially denied, if we're talking about, let's say, North Korea, linguistically denied, culturally denied. There are reasons that we cannot send in the 82nd to hit that dam in, in Burma. And there's a lot of reasons. And those are filters of denial. And so SOF gets through those filters of denial through, through the way that we operate, either through small, discrete teams, low visibility, fast surgical strike operations, or through working with partners who have who can breach that, that filter and go through that filter of deniability. So I really have to look for where my gaps are at. If I can go to the X, then I don't need I don't need a partner. And and earlier it was stated that you know in a regular warfare it should be 99% indigenous approach and 1% us. I, I would argue with that. I, I really would. I would say that that as a tool, if I'm using the partner as as a means, I mean a way to get to it and not the means, then you know I only need them insofar as um, there's it, the area is denied to me. Right. And, and if I need if I evaluate, do they meet that criteria? Can they do the things that I cannot do because they have the permission or it's their area um, and they, they, they by default have it? Then they meet that criteria of partnership. They meet that criteria. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about very much at a tactical level. I understand that building coalitions and, and, and you know, th that's very important at other levels and for different reasons. But at the tactical level, I have to look for people that fill my gaps. I can't look for redundant capability. So when we say with and through, I very much need a through partner and not a with partner, right? And the difference is, I've said this before, a with partner looks like me. He has interoperability with me, his equipment looks like me, his comms are the same as mine, and he adds 
capacity. I don't need more capacity in this fight. I need a different capability. And so a through partner allows me to operate through him and he fills those gaps that I don't have in my capability and, and allows me to reach deeper into that denied space, whatever that denied space may be. So that's how I uh, evaluate the criteria. Is this partner valuable to me or not? I'm not trying to make them in the image of my own self, right? And give them an identical capability capability. I want them to be them, themselves and bring to the table the capability that I don't have. And I think that works then moving up from the tactical to the strategic level as well, the uh, with and through. With that uh, and this discussion of denial and distraction, really uh, there's uh, several questions that have come in and I'll, I'll group them together because they really build on uh, Duke, what you just ended with, and 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 points that both Elizabeth and uh, uh, Shannon made. So the first is this: uh, for a price, could China convince Russia to create a feint, in effect, to draw U.S. and Allied forces away from Taiwan to set conditions for an invasion of Taiwan? Uh, and then the related question is similar to Russia's use of surrogates in Ukraine and Crimea. Is Moscow likely to employ Russian-backed surrogates to support China's influence agenda in the Indo-Pacific? And if so, should special operations PME be standardized uh, uh, between this, uh, between the Five Eyes, or at least between uh, Australia and the United States? So uh, some talk there about, and this brings us back to the Russia question, uh, Russian tactics, uh, you know, denial, feint, uh, and so on and so forth. And whoever would like to to, to start with that, uh, feel free. Uh, perhaps I'll I'll uh, lay out a few thoughts there. Um, on the Taiwan issue, I would be very surprised if if Russia would agree to that, uh, because uh, for two reasons. One is that it would be a very costly move. It would involve Russia potentially in a war with the United States. Uh, Russia has a, a, a an eastern uh, coastline, uh, the Russian Far East, at, uh, an enormous territory, two thirds the size of the U.S. that it's been trying to develop over the last several decades. That would be jeopardized, and all the um, uh, energy infrastructure projects along with them. Um, and for the second reason, I think that to a certain degree, it it reduces pressure on Russia to have U.S. the U.S. and China China facing off on Taiwan because the focus in East Asia is on China, not on Russia. Um, and so I, I don't see Russia being uh, amenable to that. In terms of the uh, the um, the non-state actors, I think that depends on the issue. I think that. We do see some coordination of messaging between China and Russia on certain issues like COVID related issues to a certain degree, but and then they differ on other parts of that messaging. Uh, so I think it would de depend on the question because Russia does have its distinct interests. For example, in the South China Sea, I don't see Russia supporting unequivocally uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese approach to the South China Sea. Um, for example, uh, with respect to the 2016 uh, decision, Russia was opposed to uh, another body deciding on the question, but never said specifically that it supported China's position on the South China Sea. So, uh, so I think it, there would be some circumstances where we would see common messaging, but not, uh, not in all circumstances. Yeah, Elizabeth, I'd like to jump in on this as well. And kind of the second part of the question, Nick, um, I think what Duke was talking about was extremely important when you talk about PME and soft per, is capability and capacity. Uh, where I disagree with Duke is that there are areas that we need more capacity. We, we never have enough capacity. I mean, the United States is approximately 5% of the world's uh, population. There is um, a very limited amount of special operations. We think there's a lot now. But in reality, we're very, very small capability. Uh, when you look at working with partners, uh, we, we definitely need more like capability. Um, but at the same time, we also need, uh, I mean, like capacity and build capacity on our side. But we do need capabilities that we don't have, that the Australians don't have. And I think that that's where it comes into play. And when you talk about Russia, you know, we talk about 
recent events, I'm always reminded of the Faulkner quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And that's why I kind of brought up some of those maps is that Russia and China, had, though officially they don't have a border dispute, in reality they do. Uh, when you look at the number of Chinese crossing over the Amur River, it is a constant irritant uh, to the Russians. And we also have the, uh, coming back to the Korean conflict, you know, we have a situation where they did kind of coordinate um, at the tactical operational strategic level uh, to conduct an action that had things going on in the East and West and it backfired heavily. Um, before Korea happened, there was very limited U.S. presence in Western Europe because of the Korean conflict. Suddenly there was a huge emphasis and Seventh Army was reestablished. And so I definitely think that looking at Russia, we can't divide them, but understand that Again, their interests are very different. And when you look at different capacities and capabilities of all the various partners, especially those uh, Russians and other ethnic groups, I, I, I like to stress this, the Russian Federation is a federation. There are various other ethnic groups. We talk about the Republic of Buryat, the Buryat Republic, the Tovo Republic. These are not oblasts. Um, they have large ethnic entities that are players in the area, and they are part of a Mongolic civilization that sometimes we forget exists throughout Central Asia and has a character that's in direct conflict with the Chinese civilizational model. And so again, looking at partners with capability versus capacity and where those interests lie, specifically with Russia and the Far East, we have some examples that are, that are still with us today that are a constant irritant between Russia and China's continued cooperation or the quote-unquote alliance that they have. I think Elizabeth brought many of those things up. Yeah, and so uh, I guess I'll agree to disagree with the man. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, uh, you know, definitely in preparation for something, uh, you know, uh, capacity definitely becomes an issue. But I think right now capability is, is something that we lack to, to get at this type of fight. Um, but again, uh, neither one is a bad thing, right? Um, I think uh, this discussion, though, when we talk about uh, surrogates, little green men, PMCs, and, and we, we refer to, you know, uh, Russia support to China and these type of operations, um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, because Russia's model of this looks more like our model of what we're recognizing, that perhaps we're, we're looking for that connection. Um, but we can't discount that China, they've been doing this for a long time as well. Right. So they've got their own little green men and their own, you know, be it irregular maritime or the Wa State Army or, you know, other you know, drug cartels that they're supporting and they're using and leveraging and coercing throughout Asia with their own, you know, the triads. They're you're using um, irregulars as well in this fight in, in their own way. And so the problem is if we don't orient ourselves to the situation that it is a fight and how they're using them, then we're stuck in that, um, you know, the Boyd's Law and the OODA loop where we're, we're waiting for the act to happen and we're missing the fact that we didn't orient ourselves to the fact that it is happening right now. Just because it doesn't look like, you know, tanks rolling down Main Street doesn't mean that they're, they're not achieving the same objectives through perhaps not physical occupation. As I said, we have to change our, our definition of denied space. Another one that I've been keen in on is we need to change our, our understanding of what occupation is in, in the competition game, right? So occupation is a form of control and they occupied to physically control. But if they're controlling through economic occupation or through political occupation or through cultural occupation and they're achieving the same end states and the end games, then are we recognizing that as occupation? And if we aren't, then are we recognizing that our, our doctrine does not give us the tools for resistance to that form of occupation? If we're still waiting for little green men and tanks to roll down Main Street to you know, activate our underground and our auxiliary forces and our guerrillas in the mist, then we're missing the fact that they're, they're already gaining that control through other forms of occupation. And we have not evolved fast enough to other forms of resistance or to advise our partners for other forms of resistance. And so I think that's the, 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 the danger of looking for the little green men problem that may or may not ever come in this situation. Duke, that's a great observation and it reminds me of a, a piece from last summer in the Naval War College Review by uh, Nadia Shadlow, who, you know, as everyone may recall, served in the National Security Council. Uh, uh, during the uh, during the Trump administration, and one of her big worries is precisely as you said, while we're waiting for a military response, 
uh, or a military action, uh, you know, something, another tool of statecraft has been used that then makes the military uh, uh, tool irrelevant. So I think that's a great point. Uh, and Shannon, just as you were talking, I couldn't help but uh, remember uh, during the, the 19th century ga great game, the extent to which, as you uh, pointed out, the, you know, the, the Russian government used the uh, ethnic diversity of the empire uh, you know, how many Buryats, Tuvans, and others were agents of the Russian Empire, uh, even all the way to Tibet, in a way that the British and the French and others could not, uh, could not access. Uh, but Shannon, something that you said, which then ties into a question which is being uh, directed directly to uh, uh, Dr. Wishnik, uh, which is this idea of uh, the extent to which Russia and China can be divided. And uh, the, the questioner asks, uh, can you elaborate on why you see the U.S.'s ability to influence Sino-Russian relations as limited? What, if anything, could the U.S. do to exacerbate any divides in that relationship? I, I think that uh, the, the ability to divide them is, is um, limited because of the domestic drivers that bring them together. Uh, so... Um, I don't think we can we can really affect those domestic drivers. What we can do is uh, some of the um, ideas that were proposed on this panel by by uh, Devon Shannon, for example. He talked about the role of partners. And I think there we can do a better job. For example, in the Arctic, we talk a lot about China and the Arctic. Why aren't we talking about Japan in the Arctic or Korea in the Arctic or India in the Arctic and try to engage more with a variety of of uh, outsider observer states, uh, instead of highlighting uh, China, which only promotes its role. Uh, and similarly in, in uh, Eurasia, I think there are many states that uh, are uncomfortable with their position between China and Russia, like Mongolia uh, or Kazakhstan, or, uh, and would appreciate more engagement, not just on security matters, but on uh, for example, uh, Mongolia is very concerned about its energy independence. Um, so can we engage more with Mongolia on that issue? Um, so, I, so I think working with partners is one aspect. Another aspect is trying to find areas where we can work with both Russia and China on areas of interest to the U.S. Um, and we managed to do that during the Cold War with the Soviet Union on Arctic issues in terms of Arctic science. Uh, certainly, uh, climate issues are important to deal with with China. So I think we can find uh, areas to work with, although the circumstances, of course, uh, are very difficult because of all the conflicts we have with each country. Um, but I think that rather than looking for wedges, I think to look for what are U.S. interests, what are our partners' interests, and to, and to uh, focus um, on those aspects. Another question that's come in and I think is, is really drawing out of our, our comments earlier that you have been bringing forward about, you know, the overall, what are U.S. interests? So taking uh, Elizabeth's last point, what are U.S. interests uh, in, in, in different parts of the region? And tying that to, to earlier points about uh, we, we are facing powers that are seeking to revise, but is revision necessarily automatically always a bad thing? I, I think we could probably say forcible revision is something that's out. But a question that's come in, uh, which kind of takes this, you know, this this approach of, uh, you know, is is some revision possible in, in aligning with U.S. interests? And and the question the questioner asks, since China has been a beneficiary of the U.S. led world order, can you foresee spheres of influence, a Eurasian Yalta? as beneficial to U.S. interests? And is and the example that the questioner provides, is China stabilizing Afghanistan so bad for the United States? So let me throw that out uh, uh, to the panel uh, to uh, get your reaction to uh, the questioner. Um, I, I'll lead off with this one uh, on it. And I, the simple answer is I think no. Um, it comes down to what is it that a world with China, as say FDR said, with the five policemen in the spheres of influence, what does that look like? And how does that counteract with our concept of free Indo-Pacific, uh, our Wil Wilsonian ideals towards uh, international affairs? You know, there are more countries representing more nationalities in the world now than there's ever 
been in the modern period when we can say there's countries, uh, especially where people can interact. Um, and that has given a greater level of diversity, uh, both from a high linguistic, not a low linguistic level, as well as cultural level than we've, we've ever seen. Um, a world in which you have a Chinese sphere of influence in Asia is a world of signification. Um, we see this heavily in Tibet and Xinjiang and most recently in Inner Mongolia, where it's literally the destruction of language, destruction of culture, uh, the destruction of ways of thinking. Um, but we also see this in China internally. One of the recent things that I noted that didn't get much play is even before COVID, the amount of Americans that were teaching English in China was getting less and less and less and harder and harder to do. And now China's changed its academic situation so that they no longer are teaching English actively inside their schools. And they're trying to ensure that the subjects that they taught in those languages, mainly math and science, are now taught in Chinese. Um, so yes, Afghanistan will always be Afghanistan. Again, it doesn't matter when Afghanistan is Afghanistan, it's still Afghanistan. Um, but that transitory concept of allowing the Chinese to signify Afghanistan and liquidate it does not really provide us much of a gain that would help and enhance our way of the world in a rules-based order. Um, so I kind of go with that, that the simple answer is no. The big answer is to do that takes us down the road of signification. And I don't think that's a road that we want to go down. And in a diverse, uh, culturally homogenous type environment that we tend to desire, that uh, that would be the exact opposite direction. Um, I, would, I would also say no, but for different reasons. I would say that this kind of sphere of influence approach objectifies the countries in the regions who want to be autonomous. And if you look at, at all of the countries in Central Eurasia, they each have their own development, a regional development plan, including Russia, <laughs> Kazakhstan, Mongolia. And so they don't want to be a part of the, the Chinese uh, vision of economic or political order. And, and neither do uh, they want to be a part of a, a US order necessarily. I think they want to engage with countries that will give them autonomy. Um, and also, I think in Afghanistan, China's uh, capabilities there are limited. If, if there were a UN peacekeeping mission, China might provide troops, uh, but China doesn't have the experience in, in this uh, sphere. And they provide limited aid to Afghanistan compared to India, let's say. And I think if China were more involved militarily in, in maintaining security, this would cause problems with other regional powers. So I don't see that as a solution. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, my la my opinion is going to be the last one on this because it's very little. I, I, I you know, I, I, I agree with with both of uh, what the other panelists said, but I, I think that ultimately I try not to assign, you know, uh, right or wrong, you know, uh, good or evil. Uh, you, you know, to me these are unhelpful when we're talking about competition. Right, is to characterize like we are the good guys, they're the bad guys. Hey, we're competing. This is it. We're in a game war competing, and this is the way it is. In my opinion, I keep uh, my my moral judgments of their their methods and their their order. You know, so I don't say these are like Chinese malign activities. No, they're just Chinese activities. I just I, I reckon try to recognize them for what they are objectively, and recognize what they're trying to do in the game and what we're trying to do. And so, you know, hey, if if they come out on top and manifest destiny, and they end up, you know, having a different revisionist power, is it? Is it something that's good or bad? It is what it is. And I think that, you know, we would be naive to think that the world doesn't change and that there isn't a revision that's happening all the time. Um, now, can we maintain our status quo and, 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 and freedom of maneuver and power base and support for people's autonomous sovereignty, you know, throughout the world and, and kind of our liberal democracy ideals um, as in this process of change. And I think that that's kind of the goal is is to steer the change versus stop the change. I, I don't think that we're going to stop, you know, uh, the change from happening. I think as best possible, we can inject ourselves into that and kind of be the, the leader of this change if, as much as possible and kind of show the good of what we can do versus or the good of what's come out of our um, our, our, you know, uh, methods and our and our way of, of governance. But again, I don't think we're going to stop change of some sort from happening. Thank you. Uh, 
There was one more question that came through, but uh, Elizabeth, you did touch on it, which is uh, greater focus and understanding differences between Russia and China, and you've talked about the Arctic and, and Central Asia. Uh, Duke, I think you've given us really the, the, the bridge for this panel to the rest of the conference, which is how do we retain our freedom of maneuver to defend our interests? How do we steer the change, which I think is the challenge that we're going to be facing uh, and watching the uh, clock tick down, I will now uh, uh, thank the panel uh, for uh, their insightful contributions to the audience for a wonderful set of questions and uh, turn uh, the control back over uh, to our conference hosts uh, for bringing this session to a close.